So again, welcome everybody. I am Rachel Kiesler. I am from the Connecticut Family Support Network. I am a family support coordinator for the Northwest and Southwest region in Connecticut. I am also the parent of a special needs 10 year old and a 16 month old little girl. And I also want to introduce our lovely presenters today. We have Ann Giordano and we also have Bruni Edwards. They are both from Ed Advance. And I also just wanted to say that I know them both professionally. I used to work at Ed Advance and collabor collaborated with them for many years. Um, so I am very happy to have them here with us today. And I hope that you all enjoy their presentation. So Anne and Bruni, whenever you are ready to start. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining on this beautiful luncheon, luncheon time today. Uh, my name is Ann Giordano. As Rachel said, I'm an early childhood specialist at, at Advance. I've been there for a number of years and have worked many, many, many years in the Birth to Three program, as well as with other programs, including Early Head Start. And I now do a lot of training in the area of infant toddler development, infant mental health, et cetera. And I work, um, I do specific training around this topic uh, for the birth to three system for newly, uh, newly being trained service coordinator. So I'm delighted that you're here and I thank you for taking the time. Uh, Bruni. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bruni Edwards. I am the director of Ed Advances Birth to Three Services. Welcome. So should we just go ahead, Rachel, and get started? Okay, so uh, I'm going to start uh, just to let you all know, you know, we have an hour, it's not a ton of time, certainly. And what we realize is um, in that hour, you'd probably like to talk more among each other and with each other than hearing and seeing a lot of PowerPoint slides. So uh, we're going to show a few slides to get us started and kind of frame this work. Uh, but as um, Rachel said, and Bruni and I will take turns going through that, um, it's really very much an overview, but we specifically made it brief in terms of that so that we can leave time for specific questions at the end, because I think we learn not only, um, you certainly learn not only from us, but we will learn from each other in that way. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Let's see, where did I, okay, of course, of course, there it is. All right, one second, let me just get this up. Can everybody see this? Yes, okay. Um, where's my silly toolbar? Go away toolbar. Okay. Okay, of course it didn't behave. Okay, can everyone see that? You good? All right, so we're just gonna kind of do an overview today of thinking about that, um, the, the change from the birth to three system into whatever is next for our almost three-year-olds or actually anyone leaving the birth to three system and transitioning on to something else. In particular today, we'll look at um, understanding what that preschool special education uh, process is. Um, our objectives today really in a brief amount of time are that you'll begin to understand the steps that go with that, learn a little bit about what the eligibility is for to meet pre-K special education, learn some strategies to maybe help to describe your child in ways that will really help the school system uh, know and, and know about them, know how they learn, what makes them tick, what works really well for them, what are some areas of challenge, and also um, understand about the new services over three law, which just unfolded this past, um, this past summer, actually. So the first thing I just kind of wanted to mention is that um, <clears throat> there are, whether we're talking about the birth to three system, or we're talking about the pre-K special ed system, both of those systems fall under both federal and state law. So um, the public law, the major public law that, um, that sort of um, dictates what happens in this system is Public Law 108, 446, which is part of IDEA. You might have heard of that, I, which stands for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. 
And then the second law that sort of governs what happens and particularly important for us to always think about. And the reason that I bring this up and have you remember that, that what happens in these systems are rooted in law. And, and that brings about lots of things. It brings about lots of rules and regulations. But with that, and I think the most important thing to know for parents is that with that, it brings rights to you. And it's so important for you to know what your rights are within this law, within both of these laws. So <clears throat> there are two parts to the law. So part C of IDEA is what governs the birth to three system. So you might hear that sometimes, oh, they were in part C or they were in part B. Part C is the birth to three side of things. So it covers children from ages right from birth right up through their second birthday. It really has a major focus on the family and even the document that goes with that, the governing document that lists everything about that child and family and what it is you're gonna work on and what the services are included in the name of that document is the word family. So it's called the IFSP, Individualized Family Service Plan. Families are a huge piece of writing that plan. It cannot be written without families present. Um, and it really focuses very much on what the family has identified as their, um, their supports, their strengths, their challenges, what it is they wanna work on for their child. And it's all housed within what we call natural environments. And natural environments is not only just a place. Natural environments means daily routines that happen for that child. So you might see goals and outcomes written around bath time. You might see goals and objectives written around meal time. You might see goals and objectives written around going to Target because that's an area of challenge for a family. So natural environments, very inclusive of the family. And then it also very clearly outlines exactly what services and supports will be provided by the birth to three system. Then you have part B and part B is sort of the pre-K side of things. So that covers children, certainly of what we're talking about today, ages three, but potentially up through age 21, depending on whether or not that child um, is eligible to receive special education services past their 18th birthday. Part B focuses much more strongly on the child. Part C focuses on the child as well, but also on the family. Part B focuses specifically on the child and the document or the plan that's itemized and written, the governing plan that uh, dictates what happens in Part B is called the IEP, which just means individualized education plan. And you'll see that the word family is not in there. Um, that's not to mean that school districts don't care about families or don't want to include families. It just means that this plan is much more focused on the educational outcomes and needs of that child. Um, their services are delivered in what we call the least restrictive environment. So that is generally a school-based program with the least amount of extra supports in order for that child to function um, at their optimum. Um, and those services are provided. Sometimes you might see the terminology local education agency or LEA, sometimes it's shortened. It really just means the school district. IDEA requires transition. So within the law, so those are the things that govern the law, the components of, of what those documents are, et cetera. And then there is language in IDEA that, that talks about how should this transition happen? What should it look like? Um, and so there are several components to that. And um, Birth to Three programs are very, very aware of what these, um, all of these um, specifics are, particularly the first one, which means it must be a smooth and effective process. So again, smooth is a subjective word, so it can look differently to different people, but it really means it should work well for all parties involved. It must include what we call a 90-day conference, which is the responsibility of birth to three to convene. So the 90-day conference is not a PPT. It sometimes can be held in conjunction with a PPT, but it must be convened by birth to three, and it must happen at least 90 days before that child's third birthday. 
Um, it should have participation by the school district. Uh, we love that when school districts are part of that 90 day meeting. Sometimes it, it may happen by phone or by virtual in, in our world today, but um, very often they happen in person and it's a wonderful way uh, with the goal of just beginning to develop this relationship between the child, the family and the school. And then the last one is that an IEP must be developed and implemented by the child's third birthday if that child was determined eligible for Part B. So you can see by that statement that that means that many steps have to happen before that in order to have eligibility determined. And certainly if the eligible, if the child is determined eligible for Part B, that the IEP and services are all ready to go at that child's third birthday. So then there are some very specific steps that happen within these timelines. And I'm gonna turn this over to Bruni and she's gonna talk a little bit more through what these individualized steps look like that for children, families in both birth to three and the school. Thank you, Anne. Um, so our program, we serve um, 39 different towns and some of those towns are regionalized. So um, we don't have 39 different districts. We have about 28 because we serve the Northwest corner and a lot of those towns are regionalized. Um, they can look different. That transition process can vary um, from LEA to LEA. So I'm going to just give you a sort of a general sense of what happens, but please know that um, you might be in an LEA that does uh, that transition process with birth to three um, a little differently. So on the birth to three side, what we're, require, what we're required to do is hold that transition meeting 90 days before the child turns three. LEA stands for Local Education Agency. So it's another term for um, school district. I did see that, that, um, yes, you're welcome. Yeah, so LEA is basically another term for school district. Um, so six months before your child turns three, your service coordinator should come to you and ask you um, if you would want to include the LEA in the transition conference. Now that transition from birth to three, out of birth to three for some families does not include the LEA. So I wanna be certain to mention that not all of our families um, choose to send their children on to Part B services. They have chosen to do other things um, when their children transition out of birth to three. But the majority of families do wanna do what we call a referral to the LEA. And so what happens is six months before your child turns three, your service coordinator um, should have you sign a, what's called the 3-8 form. That is the approval to include your LEA in the transition conference. So again, that is a birth to three meeting and we're seeking permission from the family to include the school district in our meeting. What, what varies from um, district to district is some districts for that meeting will come to the family's home and sit in on our transition conference hear about what birth to three has been doing. Um, the family talks about, you know, um, their child's strengths and um, what the concerns are. We talk about our birth to three outcomes and um, the LEA in turn will tell the family what is next on their end. So a lot of times what happens at this transition meeting sometimes gets very, very confusing for families and for actual for school districts because some district some districts will make our birth to three transition meeting their PPT one. 
So when they combine the transition meeting with their PPT-1, um, and they're allowed to do that, and that does happen, um, what that does is um, it sort of eliminates one of the meetings the LEA has to do to determine eligibility. Some LEAs want the family and the birth of three provider to go to their school, their location to do our transition meeting. And if it's okay with the family, we do that. So we, we go to the school. Most school districts still are doing remote um, PPTs, remote transition conferences. So we're joining, they're joining us remotely. Um, so I, I, I suspect we're gonna have a lot of questions about this because it is, it gets confusing for families. Um, so we ask you to sign the 3-8 form when your child is two and a half years old. You either sign it to approve, to invite the LEA, or you sign it to not invite the LEA to the transition conference. And, what, and if you sign to not include the LEA, what happens is we still send that form to the LEA because under child find law, the LEA needs to know that this family has chosen not to refer for Part B services. The other option you can do is if you signed to include the LEA, but you change your mind, um, you then revoke the approval. You revoke your consent to include the LEA in our transition meeting. That's a lot, I know. We'll, we'll definitely go over that again. And do you wanna move forward? Did you want to just mention sometimes too during this, like this last six month period, these might be some other things that families in birth to three might work on together. If the, just helping that child get ready for whatever it might be, maybe they're going to a, a typical childcare program, maybe they're doing, doing, going to stay home, but they're going to start participating in things like library programs or family resource center groups, et cetera. So birth to three might begin to assist you and your family with practicing some of those um, other kinds of things that might happen once the once your child turns three. Okay. Right. Thank you, Ann. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. So, like I said before, a lot of our um, some families don't um, refer to the school district when their child turns three. They choose to do other things, like go to a typical developing preschool, or go to um, the local FRCs for play groups, or to the library for play groups. Um, there are other options for some families, depending on the child's needs. And so on the school side, their responsibility is to attend our transition conference if the family has chosen to include them in the transition meeting. Um, then they are, after that meeting happens, then the LEA will invite the family to their PPT-1 if they've not combined it with um, birth to threes meeting and PPT2. And it is at PPT2 where um, LEAs typically talk about eligibility, whether or not the child is eligible for Part B services based on the evaluation results they have done or have obtained from birth to three. Some districts will use the birth to three evaluation results to determine eligibility for Part B services. The family has to agree to that. If the LEA is using the birth to three evaluation uh, results to determine eligibility, again, the family has to agree to that. Um, and so then at PPT2, they will let you know um, whether your child is eligible for Part B services and the next steps after that. And that's the, that's the meeting that the IEP is developed at PPT2. 
I, I did see, uh, uh, can someone read out the, the two questions that came up? Um, <clears throat> Vanessa asked what, um, what is PP, PPT1? So PPT1 is just basically the LEA's informa uh, information gathering meeting. So if they've combined it with birth to three's transition meeting, they're just basically listening uh, um, to the parent and birth to three's uh, experience with the child, the, uh, the results of the evaluation, the birth to three evaluation, what the outcomes and the goals are. And there was, there was a one more question. Oh, it looks like it just came in. And then another one, if, can you see them? So if the they do not allow, cool. oh, okay, um, go well, ahead. I'm sorry. If they do not allow the school to utilize the birth to three eval, is the school then obligated to conduct full special ed testing that they would do on a child who is seeking special ed services and not coming from birth to three? So I, I answer this cautiously because the rules around part B, I'm not an expert um, around that. Most districts that we work with will do their own um, evaluation, regardless of whether birth to three's eval was last month two months ago, three months ago, they will do their own testing. Um, if they do not want birth to three evaluation, if they want to do their own, they, they, what will happen is they'll ask the family to bring the child into the school and their staff will do the evaluation. I think that's what the question was. If it's more specific, we can get to it at the end. And then there was one other quick one. Um, does the child attend PP1 and PPT2? Well, um, so if it's being combined with the birth to three meeting, the transition meeting, the child is typically there because birth to three does um, home visits with the child and parent. But if the PPT1 is at the school, um, no, the child typically doesn't have to be there, but I do, um, I do encourage you to bring the child because it gives the school district another opportunity to see and observe the child in, in the space, but it's not intended to be a child friendly meeting, meaning um, that that's really more paperwork um, driven. Um, if the school is doing their own testing, they will ask the parent to come back a different session to do the testing with the child. So um, much like um, Part C, uh, a child is eligible for Part B services if they have a disability and or they meet um, eligibility on their standardized tool, which means one, uh, two standard deviations below the, the norm or one and a half um, standard deviations in two areas. So that's basically the same eligibility criteria for birth to three. A disability alone does not guarantee services in part B. Um, uh, disabilities don't drive services, need drives services. So um, we have had um, children on the autism spectrum not meet Part B eligibility because their standardized scores did not meet um, the requirement. So just so you're aware, the, the disability alone doesn't meet Part B eligibility. There also has to be a delay. Currently, 75% of um, kids in birth to three do meet Part B eligibility. And that's based on um, data from birth to three. And um, Anne did mention this a little bit um, earlier. 
We do now have something called early intervention over three. That means birth to three over three. So this um, was started the summer after COVID started under executive order. The governor signed an executive order to allow birth to three to continue services for children who turn three during the summer. And we define summer May 1st through um, August, August 30th. And that was a way to sort of fill in the gaps of all of the things that were happening during that COVID onset, you know, services not happening, um, cancellations due to people being sick, um, remote services happening both on the birth to three side and the LEA side. So we were allowed to continue services if the child was eligible for Part B services, meaning they went through the transition process, the school determined that they were eligible for services to start, but they did not have summer services in place. Either they didn't qualify for summer services or the school was still doing remote services. So we were allowed to stay in the home and continue birth to three services until school actually started. And um, at that point, the school took over to provide services. Then the following summer, which was last summer, this happened legislatively. There was a legislative change, which now allows birth to three to continue services for children who turn three May 1st through the summer only if they're eligible for Part B services, meaning the school was going to give them services anyway, um, we can stay if a family chooses to stay in birth to three through the summer. Now, there are reasons why that's a good idea um, for um, children to stay in birth to three through the summer. One of them being, um, for example, if the child doesn't qualify for extended year, and, and that's another term for summer services. So not all children, regardless if they're three, four, five, six, 10, 20, not everyone qualifies for extended year summer services. So if your child doesn't qualify for summer services, but they do qualify for services when school starts in September, that might be a situation where a family might choose to continue services in birth to three and then start up when the school um, starts in September or at the end of August, depending on when your district starts school. Another good reason to stay in birth to three is if you have a child that doesn't take, tra um, the transitions are difficult and transitioning to a school um, staff in the summer and then having to transition again to a, a different school staff in September, um, that might be a reason to stay with their team in birth to three. I mean, people know their children best to know whether or not that's you know, a good fit for them. Um, for some children who are receiving summer services, that might be a good idea for them to go ahead and take the Part B services so they can get to know the routines in the classroom, get to know their teachers, if it is going to be the same teachers um, providing services when school starts. So there are many, many reasons why that might be a good fit to transition to Part B or not transition. I think um, Anne wants to, go ahead. Okay, I was just gonna stop for a second. Um, we have a very short video uh, that is produced by the Birth to Three system. The Birth to Three website is birth, B-I-R-T-H-2-3, the number 23, birth to three.org. I encourage uh, families to go on or, or providers to go onto the website. There's a wealth of information, particularly around transition under four families. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just show this. It's, it's just under 10 minutes, but it kind of gives the parent perspective of what it was like to move from the birth to three system and how that was. And then we'll come back and just do another slide or so and answer some questions.
Can you hear it? Okay. <clears throat> If your child has been receiving birth to three services for a while, it can be hard to think about what comes next. Sorry. The first day I dropped Milo off at school, I cried. I've never left him for these hours with anybody that I do not know. How is my child going to be with them? Is is he going to be okay? No sabía cómo iba a reaccionar mi hijo dentro de escuela. He's been, you know, by my side day one um, and then having this diagnosis i've kind of hugged him a little tighter what can you expect as you begin the transition process what are the different steps and how can you prepare yourself and your child as the child gets closer to being two and a half we make a referral to the school district we reach out to the school district with the parents' permission, and we talk about the two-step process that we have to help transition the family to the school district's responsibility. We are going to help you build a good relationship with the next people. This is what's so important. Everything is about us all being able to communicate, being able to be on board for your child. An early step in the transition process is what's called the transition meeting. This informal meeting allows families and school personnel to get to know each other and begin preparing for later steps. The transition meeting takes place with the public school and the family and Birth to Three, and it is Birth to Three's meeting. So it is our responsibility to prepare a family properly for this meeting and what is going to happen, what is going to be discussed. She prepared me to answer a lot of questions, prepared me for what was going to happen. And any question I had, she was right there. Any concern I had, she was right there. We're a team. We're going to do this together. I'm here to help you. And we're going to do what we can to get that little person enrolled in the right program that's a good fit. Families are able to make a choice about where to hold the transition meeting. So when we had the transition meeting, uh, we had three people come over to our house. Um, and our service coordinator was there. It was really great because it was in my son's natural environment. So they got to see him play and interact with me there instead of me just explaining everything to them. Our transition meeting we chose to hold at the public school. I went in very nervous to that meeting, but when we were there, the people were so warm. I was able to watch them interact with my child. I was able to see that they were really good people. Um, which calmed my nerves. The next step is the Planning and Placement Team Meeting, or the PPT. This meeting is held at the school. That's the eligibility PPT. At that meeting, they will then either decide to accept some evaluations from birth to three because they're current, or choose to do their own evaluations, or a combination of both of those. You won't go by yourself. You'll have somebody that you know with you. So that's the easy part. It is really our role to make sure the parent can really represent their child the best. She did teach me to kind of be the lead voice there. When we met with the school system, I kind of knew what to expect and knew which questions to ask. So they really did help me prepare for that. I had talked to my husband a bunch and discussed what we thought the school needed to know. So we literally went in with a checklist of things we wanted to talk about. And as we talked about them, we checked them off. <laughs> You're all nervous about it. You know, bring a family member or friend. To, if nothing else, just to sit with you. They don't even have to say anything. But you, you as a parent have a legal right to bring whoever you would like to the PPT. The second PPT meeting will determine whether a child is eligible for special education services. That team, which includes the parents, and it also includes a representative from birth to three, if they find at PPT2 when they review the evaluations that the child does have a disability and requires specialized instruction, then they'll design an individualized education program. The Individualized Education Program, or IEP, describes the special education services an eligible child will receive. IEP is our goal specifically for your child. And the goals should be what's driving the interaction with the staff and the child. So when 
first three folks are interacting with you, there are family goals. That's the whole thing. Well, what do you, what, how can we help you? And when you get to the school, it is how can we help your child? Well, we have kind of passed the baton, so I'm able to build a relationship with that family and provider so that I can better assist them with what the child's really going to need in that classroom and, you know, what are some strengths and weaknesses. And I think it helps the um, classroom teacher also just pick up that baton and continue to have that great relationship. You know, you'll, we want your child to become independent so that we are going to ask that, you know, you take a little bit of a step back and let us kind of develop the relationship with your child on our own. And we'll reach out. Certainly, we want you to be a part of it. But the roles just shift a little bit. If it is determined that your child is not eligible for special education services, your Birth to Three provider can help connect you with other community-based services to help meet your child's needs. And just because you're not eligible when you're two years, nine months, or three years old, doesn't mean you're not going to want to call your school district six months later when something's changed. And if you form those relationships at a transition conference, I think it's a little bit easier. Whether your child will be attending public school or another type of program, it's critical to prepare your child for the transition. This should include saying goodbye to your birth to three providers and visiting the new school or program. We prepared for the goodbyes. They, um, they made a picture book for Summer because we knew that you know she was going to miss them because she's seen them all the time. So my advice for the families that I work with that I know the child struggles with transitions is social stories. We take pictures of the staff, the room, so that the child gets the social story book prior to going to the preschool. And we go through the book with them. And when you're going to have Miss Jen, and she's, oh, she's going to read books to you, and build up that staff as well. I would ask to kind of visit the new facility that your child is going to ahead of time um, to prepare them so they can meet uh, their new teacher. It's a big change um, for a small child and preparing them as much as you can, it really is key. This transition will provide opportunities for both you and your child to meet people who can support your family in new ways. When family do come in and we shake hands and say hi and we say hi to the child, um, they get to sense that they're already wanted in the classroom. I think that's my role, to make sure that family feel as comfortable um, as they can in the classroom and welcome. I will go over the daily routine, what usually happens in the classroom, um, and what our policies and procedures are. And then there's a lengthy amount of time for the parent just to ask questions, because it's my chance to get to know them better their chance to get to know me and the program better and for us to start establishing a trusting relationship. One of the classroom teachers, who is actually his teacher still, um, she came out and played with him. She just came and just played. She put no demands on him. And the principal came and popped her head in and just say, hey, like, hey, welcome. We're so happy to have him. We can't wait for him to start. I left there thinking, they love that kid already, you know? So it was it was such a relieving experience when we walked out of there. I remember being able to breathe again. I really feel like that, that peer engagement is gonna be huge for him and I'm very excited for that. Honestly, just seeing her excel um so much more than i could have pictured for her um with so many resources available and so much help available come happy home and learning and singing and you can see his face and to me as a parent that's the best feeling ha mejorado su habla su este vocabulario está agarrando muy bien puede ser yo creo que está agarrando muy bien el inglés y pues por otro lado el español también. It put my son in a better place. And once you kind of realize that they're on your team and they're on your side to best help your child, it, it's a great success. The day he went and got his own backpack because I said, let's go to school. He went and got his backpack and I said, okay. And now he 
he's he's all set. He left school, so we did it right. Okay, we'll stop for just a moment. I'm cognizant of our time. Um, <clears throat> I think we have just a slide or two more and then we will close out completely and just uh, hopefully see some faces and talk to one another. So let me just uh, get back to where we were. Um, okay, so current slide. So just um, as you heard in the film, there are certain, certainly some things that families can do as well to support the, tr the transition process. So just, you know, introducing yourself and your child to the school, um, thinking about being able to describe what your child does really well, what they enjoy, what, what things do you know work for him, you or she, he or she, you know your child so well, it's really important. You also want to share any questions or concerns you might have. Think about preparing for the transition conference ahead of time. You heard in the film, uh, numerous parents saying that their birth to three service coordinators helped them kind of get ready for that and think about that. Um, and then also another dad talked about, which is so important, remembering that this is a legal meeting and you have legal rights around that. And one of the most important legal rights is that you have the right to invite anyone else you would like to be with you. So it's a really uh, helpful thing to, uh, to do that so that you're feeling comfortable and confident. Um, <clears throat> okay. um, we're going to stop here for questions. I'm going to show you actually one other um, form that we will send you. This is just one quick one. Um, this is just a sample of a worksheet that might help you to organize your, your, your thoughts around your child. And um, you heard one of the moms in there, Lisa, saying, we made a checklist. This is just an example. What are some of the things that your child is struggling with? What are the things they do really well at? What are their interests, right? What do I do to help? Because your strategies are so important. Where would you like to see uh, progress? What are your questions? Um, and so it's, and then a little checklist of some things that you might want to think about bringing with you uh, to the meeting. So we will make sure that you get all of these handouts. Rachel has them already, so we can send those out and we can also send the PowerPoint as well. So I'm going to stop there for a second and see in our last bit of time together, we know there must be some questions. So if people want to use the reaction button and raise your hand or put a question in the chat, we'll use our time to answer questions. And somebody would like to know where to um, get that worksheet that you just had up. Okay, uh, Rachel will have it and she's going to email it to you. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Other questions that came up. How I'd like to um, follow up with Elena's question because I do see that, um, I didn't really answer it fully. I think what she was asking, if the family doesn't agree um, for the school district to use the birth to three result, are they required to do their own testing? Um, I think the short answer to that is no, they're not required to do their own testing. Um, I'm not sure why a family wouldn't want birth to three um, evals to be used um, unless um, there was information not gathered during that assessment that they feel like um, didn't get captured and they want the, the LEA to do further testing or a different tool to be used. That's possible, but without really getting the details as to why a family would not want the birth to three evaluation um, results used by a district. Um, it, it's hard to answer that, but I think the legal answer is no. Districts do not have to move forward with a PPT process if they feel that the child um, is not eligible given the information that they have. I don't have anybody specific in mind or a certain case example. I was just kind of thinking back to when I've done other ones um, in our district. I think they do prefer to use the birth to three evaluation so that they don't have to kind of 
expend their resources to, to do it themselves. Um, but parents do sometimes feel like the school is going to be, I don't want to say more thorough than birth to three, but you know, if they've been in birth to three for a year, two years, three years, they might feel that like, isn't there a new set of questions or a new test or a new tool um, that we should be looking at for my now three-year-old, so. Right, right. Um, so not to not get into the weeds too much legally, if a district doesn't do their own testing for a child that looks like they're not eligible for on the birth to three side um, results, um, one would question whether they've done their due diligence in determining the eligibility if they're just using the birth to three evaluation results. Got it. Thank you. So another one, um, I want to. I'll go to the top. I see there's Vanessa has a question and uh, Devin has a question. So Devin's question is: How has the pandemic affected our ability to bring our children to the actual school? prior to the beginning of pre-K and is that still how it stands? I would suspect it's somewhat a district by district response at this point. Uh, I'm not sure, Bruni, do you have any direct um, experience? Is the, what's the, can you read the question again? The question is, can with the pandemic, uh, were children allowed to be going into the school to, to visit ahead of time? potential birth to three children going to school. I think it's probably still a district by district response at this point. Correct, um, correct. I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. There, we still have districts that are not holding PPTs in their own building. They are doing it remotely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So ho hopefully we're coming out the other side of that. Um, right. So then this is another evaluation that. assessment question from Vanessa. Is it possible for both assessments, so birth to three and the school district, to be reconciled and used for determining eligibility? I, I would say certainly in my experience, there have been times when sometimes they do them together. That's really ideal where maybe um, a school district personnel will come to a home when birth to three is doing their, mo their annual reassessment um, or a birth, a birth to three provider could participate at the school as well, or they can use, one uh, one group will do certain portion of the testing and another the other entity would do the other portion of the testing. So I have seen that happen. Would you agree, Bruni? Um, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I mean, what I see more frequently is, so we are required to test children annually from the, you know, if, if a year has lapsed, we um, do the testing. Sometimes that happens right before um, PPT2, where birth to three is required to do their updated testing. A lot of districts use exactly the same standardized tool that birth to three uses. So they technically cannot replicate an eval tool that was just used. Mm -hmm. So if they, if birth to three just did the same standardized testing a month before, um, the school more than likely is going to use that, the results of that testing. Um, I mean, I think for most districts, they are, the birth to three results and the birth to three outcomes and goals are guiding their decision on, uh, on uh, eligibility. Perfect. And you know, I think to Vanessa's point too, can they, can they sometimes be shared, et cetera? I think this is all around that relationship building piece and that if there's an opportunity for that communication to happen and the family is really comfortable with with information being shared and determinations being kind of made together, it, it's always it's always a wonderful outcome when when that can happen. So that's you know I, I often say you know this is the be, the beginning in, in some cases of a relationship between a family and a school district that may last eighteen years. So we want to not that we want all children to need special ed for eighteen years. I'm not implying that, but in some cases that is the case. But either way. It's about relationship building and um, and sort of that warm handoff whenever possible to have it happen in, in the most positive of, of ways if possible. So um, Elena has also asked how, if at all, do 504s play into this discussion or is that something completely different? 
That's completely different. I, um, when we are transitioning, when a family wants to invite the LEA to our transition meeting, um, we're talking about I, an IEP. Um, I've never had a family transition out of birth to three to a 504. Doesn't mean it can't happen. I've just, I've not experienced that at the age of three. And then Vanessa was just asking if we can use some of this information. Um, I would assume you mean, Vanessa, back to our questions about the evaluations. I mean, I think anything is open for communication with a, with a school district and saying, you know, how might we be able to share? Like Bruni said, if something was just very, very recently completed, why would it not make sense and be prudent, particularly in not wanting to repeat um, evaluations that were already done. Or if that Battelle, for example, was done a month before the child's third birthday, well, maybe the school would use a different tool then just so that we're getting a more holistic view. So um, again, it goes back to communication and conversation. So Vanessa is asking briefly, what is a 504? And I'm not an expert in 504. So if anyone else is, please feel free. But my understanding is a 504 would be a plan written for a child who might not meet the criteria for special education, but they need particular some particular special accommodations in order to help them to be safe. So it might be, um, um, for ex uh, an example, a child maybe who has a seizure disorder, who cognitively and developmentally is functioning okay, but when they're outside climbing, for example, they, they, we wanna be sure they have a helmet or something in the event that they were to have um, a, a seizure occur um, in a playground kind of act, um, environment or something like that. So um, it's, a, it's a particular area of special supports for children who don't necessarily meet the criteria for special education services. What else? Other questions? We realize this is a topic that could go way more than an hour. Um, anything else that came up for anyone? Uh, we're certainly able to stay on a few minutes. Anything from the film that came up that people had questions about? And did you, when you were going over your worksheet, um, did you sort of state what we had um, talked about, about using that worksheet really to talk about what, what children need as far as um, outcome-based and not discipline? Sure, that's a great point. Um, one of the reasons a form like that can be helpful is it's really a way of describing your child's strengths, right? The things they do really well and the areas that they need support. So sometimes what happens is, and it's a very normal, natural way for us to think, right? As parents in particular, we're worried about our children. We want them to have the services they need. So it's very common to go to a district and say, my child needs speech OTPT. That's what they need. But that's, those are service recommendations. They're not outcome recommendations. So by writing down on a form like I shared there, and you could make up any kind of form around that, that just says, for example, what are the areas that my child does really well? Because we want to start with strengths and interests, but also where is it that they need support? So if you were to write, for example, my child need, would need help walking to the playground and managing the play equipment. My child needs help holding their spoon. My child gets really frustrated when people get in their space and he hits sometimes, whatever it is, what you're describing what your the areas of challenge. The school district will understand what that means in terms of services. But to just say my child needs PTOT and speech doesn't really describe your child. To say my child has Down syndrome doesn't really describe your child. That's a diagnosis. So by really spending a little bit of time saying, this is what they do really well. These are the areas. My child's a runner. Um, loud noises scare him or her. Um, he has trouble expressing himself using words. Um, so he does better with pointing. Those kinds of things will give that next agency, that next um, um, entity a much better description of what your child needs and how to best support him or her than just saying that they need a service, if that makes sense. 
Okay, I think there was one other question came in. What is the earliest time to do the referral and subsequent PPT-1? Um, well, really a child can be referred at any time, um, especially if it's um, a situation where it's very clear that your child may need ongoing services at the time of three, that referral could be done at any time, but the PPT would be more likely to happen. Oh, the transition conference has to happen at least 90 days, but it can happen as early as two and a half, so at, at six months before, the PPTs generally would happen more closely to those school-based timelines, I would guess, Bruni, would you agree? Correct, right. So a PPT one can never happen before birth to three's transition meeting. Um, so, so before when we do days. the referral at 2.5, will we have you sign the 3-8 form at 2.5, letting you know that, um, uh, that we're going to invite the LEA to our transition meeting with your permission. And that form also allows us to release documents to the LEA. So we typically write on there any avals we've done, the eligibility eval, any IFSPs that we have up to that point that allows us to release those documents to the LEA. So we go ahead and, and share it with them before the transition meeting happens. Now, this is assuming that the referrals all came on time, right? So you can refer to birth to three up until 45 days before your child turns three. So obviously that is a very late referral as far as getting these meetings in done on, you know, and uh, on time. So things would just shift the later the referral comes in, um, the, the, the shift will happen. So if we can get it in 90 days before the child turns three, if it was a late referral, we always try to do that. But then it does, um, the clock starts ticking for the LEA once they receive the referral from us. But re just remember, it is a different timeline for the LEA than it is for um, birth to three. Birth to three runs on calendar days um, and the school district runs on school days. So if there's vacations in there, um, they don't count those days and they don't count holidays. And so we, can... we could have um, we could have a transition meeting happen, you know, after the 90 days, depending on the referral on when it came to us. There was one more question. Um, I'm sharing the PowerPoint and hand handouts. We will get that to you. Um, Devin has shared a note to everyone, just, just as a note to all the fellow parents, especially with children who are on the scale, don't be a afraid for your care providers to see your child at your worst because it'll only help them, right? Bad days happen, exactly. So I, you know, I think when we think as, as parents, right, about taking our children to things like meetings, et cetera, we're always hoping for them to most certainly, you know, behave and listen and do all of that. And we know that two and a half and almost three-year-olds, it's not their specialty. And, and schools are welcoming of that. They, they, want to create an environment that your child's gonna feel comfortable in while you're there. And it's also an opportunity, as, as Devin has said, to say, let me understand who, the, who this child is. So it's all okay. It's all okay. So, awesome. Also, um, just to reiterate what Ann said before, when you walk into a PPT meeting, there are a lot of people in the room. Um, school districts can have up to four or five people um, at the meeting, and that can be very intimidating. And I'm speaking from a parent um, with a special needs child. If you're not mentally prepared to walk into a room that has, you know, four to five, six people, um, you can get thrown off guard if you've not written something down. So I encourage everybody, if you're not gonna do the worksheet, at least write down some of your thoughts so that when you're in the meeting, it doesn't seem as overwhelming. Great point, Bruni, thank you. Thank you. All right, other thoughts? I'm cognizant of our time. 
Um, as I said, we're more than happy to stay on, but we try to honor, honor and respect people's, uh, people's commitments. So. All right. I'll turn it back to you, Rachel. Sure. Any other questions, anybody? Yes, you are thank welcome, Vanessa. Yeah, and thank you, everybody, um, for being here. And, and thank you, Anna and Bruni. This was wonderful. And um, I think that everybody had such amazing questions. It's This is obviously a topic that um, is needed. You know, we need to talk about it because, um, you know, like Bruni, you said that you're a special needs parent too, and, and I'm a special needs parent. So I went, I went through this transition <laughs> with my son um, you know, several years ago. So I've been through it as well. So like Bruni was saying, um, definitely, you know, have things written down and be prepared because um, when you sit down at that table, if it is in person or, or even if it's virtual, um, it's a lot. So be prepared, have, have things written down, have questions written down because they are going to use acronyms like, you know, some of you are asking, what, what is it? What is PPT? What does that mean? Um, because there are going to be things that you don't understand. So don't be afraid to ask, right? Um, always ask questions. Um, but anyways, thank you everybody for being here. And again, thank you, Ann and Bruni. Any, so yes, thank you so much. Any last questions, anybody? We, um, I will be sending out the email with the worksheets, the survey, and eventually a link to um, this video, as well as if anybody wants the PowerPoint presentation, we can send that out as well. All right, everybody, have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.